Now to our next scripture reading from Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 through 48. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evildoer. But if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, give your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go also the second mile. Give to everyone who begs from you. Do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collector, the collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord lives forever. And this is the word of the Lord. Well, thanks be to God. So in that last line of that text, Jesus tells us to be perfect. As God is perfect. Now in hearing that, we hear that we should be without fault, without blemish, blameless, sinless. I mean, if that's possible, if it's possible to be perfect, then why do we need Jesus to save us? He tells us to be perfect, yet we are saved by grace. If we have to be saved by grace, then we're obviously not perfect, right? Nevertheless, that's what the passage boils down to. Jesus telling us to be perfect. But rather than coming down to our own conclusions about what Jesus is saying when he says the word perfect, instead of going um, to those images that first cross our minds when we hear the word perfect, we should look back into the rest of what Jesus is saying in the passage to help us understand what he really means. Instead of going eye for eye and tooth for tooth, we are taught, as we are taught uh, in Exodus, in Leviticus, in Deuteronomy, as is a classic teaching, been around for thousands of years, it's not one that's very deniable, um, it's very present in the Torah, very present uh, in the world. But instead of that, we're supposed to go beyond it and to do better. Now, keep in mind that the teaching eye for eye and tooth for tooth is a very good one. It does two very important things. It gives power to the powerless. It protects you from being picked on by bullies. So if someone is hurting you or damaging your property, you have the power to do something about it. You have protection. Now, second, it ensures, this teaching ensures that the punishment fits the crime. So if someone steals, let's say, your phone, you don't get to kill them for it. They just owe you a phone. It's a teaching that makes a lot of sense. And it was a good, fair, just system. It's about being fair to both the victim and to the perpetrator. But Jesus wants to go beyond that and to do better, saying, do not resist an evildoer. Now, the Greek is even more clear than what we see in the English, as is often the case. Uh, Jesus isn't teaching us to be doormats. He's talking about vindictive resistance, retaliation, um, violent conflict, um, a fight. He's saying, don't fight. 
fight, uh, you know, with the one who's hurting you. In his day, he was addressing specifically the zealots, okay? There were the zealots were a, a group of people in Israel uh, who sought to remove Rome by means of violent revolution. They say, Rome is here. We must physically overthrow Rome with violence and get them out of this holy land. And this was an, uh, a very big, strong uh, movement uh, among the, the, the Jews, but Jesus taught a more godly way of dealing with the empire. And anyone committing evil, for that matter. Turning the other cheek, it sends a message to those who are hurting you. And anyone else around also to witness. It's like the nonviolent resistance of Mahatma Gandhi and Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. That... Uh, totally gives an image of what Jesus is really talking about. Uh, he's talking about him within the, the sights of, of a movement and dealing with a major force like that. So then we've got to ask, okay, what if somebody's breaking into your home or something? Are you not supposed to defend yourself? Well, I don't think Jesus is addressing that matter specifically in the text here, and that's something that could definitely use some conversation. But what he is talking about here is that this is a way, turning the other cheek, is a way of reclaiming your own power in the situation where you become powerless. It's about choosing to let God's glory shine instead of resorting to the same violence that's being inflicted upon you. It's choosing peace over violence, choosing good over evil, and inviting the Spirit of God into the matter. Now, honestly, it's just as uncomfortable for us today as it was for people 2,000 years ago. And so is the rest of the passage. If someone sues you for your coat, give it to them, along with your cloak. Now, what's meant here is both the inner and outer layers of clothing. So to give both is to be naked. And as much as we might think uh, that could be shameful in today's age, it was extremely shameful uh, to be naked in those days. Giving up both is to be willing to endure shame in order to resolve the conflict. That's what Jesus is teaching us. Be willing to endure shame in order to resolve the conflict. Choosing to resolve the conflict is more important than winning. It's more important than revenge, more important than vengeance. So if you're forced to walk a mile, walk the second mile as well. This is a reference to Roman soldiers and the people of their occupied territories. They could have you carry their equipment for one mile at a time. It was a rule that they were allowed to, one mile at a time. It was very abusive and very humiliating for the person who had to carry it. Not to mention very difficult because that stuff was heavy. To do it willingly and to go the second mile willingly is to receive the, the abuse and maintain your dignity all at the same time. You're taking back your power of choice in the matter, choosing the sacrificial servanthood of Jesus Christ, making your abuser unable to humiliate you and exposing the evil that they are bringing upon you. Let love rule the day, not hate. Love is more effective. And love invites gl God's glory to shine. And this is why uh, Martin Luther King said, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. He understood what Jesus was saying. He understood the power behind these words. And love is the power of God. This, in so many words, is exactly what Jesus was saying. The worldly wisdom, it teaches us to love our neighbors and hate our enemies. Root for the home team. That's what we're supposed to do. But divine wisdom, however, teaches us to go beyond that, to do better. To love our enemies and to pray for those who persecute us. 
Again, this is about reclaiming our power to decide what happens next. Choosing not to contribute to the ongoing worldly cycle of conflict. Choosing to contribute to something better. It's our responsibility and it's our privilege as followers of Christ to do more than the world does for peace, for resolution, for reconciliation, for love to abound. Jesus telling us to be perfect. It involves all these things he's talking about. Notice he wasn't talking about being sinless or blameless or without blemish or however we might want to describe the word perfect. He's talking about going over and beyond what the world expects. Being special, being holy in our lives as Christians, as followers of Christ. Being perfect in this sense is a monumental task, but it's not impossible. If any of us thinks that it is beyond us to be perfect as Jesus describes, then we should hear Paul asking us, Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in you? The one whose spirit dwells in us is the one who makes the sun rise and fall and makes the rain fall on both the good and evil alike. The one who gives blessings of life on both good and evil unconditionally. To be perfect as Jesus describes is to look at the Lord and to learn to do what we see in God. To be merciful as God is merciful. Compassionate as God is compassionate. Just as God is just. To strive for peace as God strives for peace. To love as God loves. That's what makes us perfect in God's eyes. And the Greek helps us a lot also in this part as opposed to the English. And the Greek even goes better with the passage. In that you can see um, that it's this kind of perfect that's not so much about being sinless, but it's about being full and complete. Complete like um, the seven days make a complete week. It's, that's why seven is a number of completion. It represents completion because that's the fullness of the week um, as God created it. Not being a person of faith in some things and a person of the world in other things. Not being incomplete in our faith. But rather to be people of faith in all things, at all times, toward all people. As Paul describes, God's temple is holy and you are that temple. May we go forward from this place, honestly seeking to go beyond and do better, honestly seeking and growing to be perfect in God's eyes, to be God's temple in a world suffering from its own cycle of conflict, to be led by God's Spirit which dwells within us, to give a sacrificial effort to right the wrongs of the world, to love unconditionally. Amen.